Thank you. You may be seated. Between the hours of noon and three o'clock on a Friday sometime around April AD 28, three people were hanged from a cross on a knoll called Golgotha outside the city of Jerusalem. The person in the center was not a hardened criminal. In fact, the word was he had done nothing deserving death. And in that period of time, between 12 noon and 3 p.m., this middle cross person spoke seven times. All four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, record one or more of the sayings. The fourth one comes from Matthew and Mark's record, Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 to 50. And again, the guys in the booth have kindly put it on the screen for you. If you would like to use the text of the uh, scripture itself, it's page 988 in the text. I have put the outline of the message again on the back page of the bulletin. If you would care to follow along, uh, you will see where I'm heading from that outline. Verse 45, Matthew 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Would you, Lord Jesus, this morning, say those words again to each of us so that we would understand what you meant and its significance for us today? We ask this in your holy name. Amen. In his book, Six Hours, One Friday, Max Lucado tells the story of a visit that he made to the Lock Hill Cemetery in San Antonio, Texas. As he was walking through the cemetery, noting the tombstones and the stories behind the lives of those who had been laid to rest, he came across a very unusual tombstone. There was no date of birth or death on this stone. Just the name Grace Llewellyn Smith and the two husbands who had predeceased her. And then chiseled into the tombstone these words. Sleeps but rests not. Loved but was loved not. Tried to please, but pleased not. Died as she lived, alone. If nothing else, Grace Llewellyn Smith was an honest person. Not too many people would have the courage to put the truth about their life on their tombstone. But Grace Llewellyn Smith represents many people, yes, some here today, who live their lives alone. Does God have a word to say to you? Can Jesus identify with you in your loneliness? Yes, he can. And the reason that I can make that claim is the fourth saying from the cross. Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. About 12 noon to 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. About 3 p.m., Jesus cried out in a loud voice in Aramaic, 
Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here in the moment when death was closing in around him, Jesus reached back into his childhood to the synagogue in Nazareth where he had memorized the 22nd Psalm. The amazing thing about the 22nd Psalm is that it predicts with incredible precision the events of Jesus' life at that very moment. I believe that this is, in fact, one of the strongest evidences for the inspiration of the Scripture. We can date Psalm 22. It's called the Psalm of David. We can date it around 1000 B.C. 1,000 years before the cross, David writes these words. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And then down to verse 17. Unbelievable. A thousand years before Palm Sunday, and before, of course, Good Friday. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But it's verse 1 of the 22nd Psalm that Jesus quotes, we believe, in this fourth saying from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But although we know where Jesus got these words, and that he was saying that his death was the fulfillment of the 22nd Psalm. The really important question is, what did Jesus mean by what he said? We know what he said, and we know where he got it from the 22nd Psalm, but what did he mean by the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, we have to do a little Christian theology this morning to get this. Christians understand that Jesus was and is 100% God and 100% man. The ancient creed puts it, very God of very God, very man of very man. Now that's not a mathematical formula because 100 plus 100 equals 200. It's a theological formula. It's saying that all that could be inherent in one human being as a human being, was 100% there. God was 100% there in that human being, and vice versa, that just because he was 100% God did not militate against him being fully human. The church in the first and the second century affirmed the absolute, and ab absolute divinity and absolute humanity of Jesus. They saw it as, a, as a, an issue to go to the wall for. And they left behind in their writings incredible, incredible words that give us an explanation of who Jesus is and who he was. Any attempt to deny his divinity or to deny his humanity is heresy. And we in the 21st century need to be able to say that. In this moment on the cross, it is Jesus' divinity, his being very God of very God, that is necessary for him to pay the price for our sins. The, the divinity aspect, the divine, the, the sinlessness aspect of him is the atonement for our sin and sinfulness. He is 100% divine, and it is his divinity that is carrying the price for our sinfulness. But what about his humanity? If he's 100% God and 100% man, how does his humanity fit into this equation in this moment of death? Well, the writer of the Hebrews helps us. In chapter 4, verse 15, he says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So what Hebrews 4.15 is teaching is that Jesus Christ's humanity was such that he experienced every human experience that we can ever experience, including temptation, although in his case, he did not sin. 
And so now when death is closing in around Jesus, he experienced what we have experienced and shall experience in its most climatic and intense form at the moment of our death. Jesus was alone. Imagine what it must have been like to be in the intimacy of the Father and the Holy Spirit from the beginning of time. We are told in Scripture that the Father and the Son, in his pre-incarnate form before he was conceived in the body of Mary, existed together in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son existed in the pre-incarnate before he is conceived and then given human birth by Mary, his earthly mother, he existed with the Father and the Spirit. Imagine what fellowship, what purity, what love. Compare that to what Jesus is experiencing on the cross. He is cut off from God. There is no fellowship of the Trinity. There is no purity which there would have existed in the pre-incarnate form because all of our sins have been placed on him. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, St. Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So all of sin is upon him. So he's been cut off from the fellowship of the Trinity. He has all the sins of, of the human race on his back. Is he still loved by the Father? Oh, he is. But in order for him to fully experience all the ramifications of sin, he must be cut off from the love of the Father. How does that happen? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what this means. Jesus, very man of very man, fully human, is cut off from even the love of his heaven. Some of you are here today saying, I have come here feeling incredibly alone. May I tell you this? There is another person here today who is not visible to our eye, but who is here through his spirit. He too felt what you are feeling. He too felt what Grace Llewellyn Smith died feeling. Sleeps but rests not, loved but was not loved, tried to please but please not, died as she lived alone. Today I would like to explore three kinds of aloneness that Jesus experienced in that moment. The first, the loneliness of a broken relationship. I've subtitled this one, The Absence of Meaningful Relationships. The demographics are clear every time a census is taken in Canada. In fact, if you read the examiner last night, you saw that in a report to city council for tomorrow night, the report is going to tell that 26% of all households in Peterborough and Peterborough County have only one person living. of all the households not in Toronto not in northern Africa here in Iraq and Syria in Peterborough single parents persons who have chosen not to marry widows 
widowers. I'm volunteer chaplain at Noah Princess Gardens. I, Betty and I go uh, the second Sunday of every month to Princess Gardens to do the chapel service. If we're lucky, there's one man. All the rest are women who have outlived their spouses. It's just as common. It just, it's just, and, and it's going to simply, that particular demographic is going to become more and more common. The loneliness of a broken relationship. By 21st definition, Jesus was a single person. Jesus was a single person. He never married. He never had a spouse. The idea of children was never even a possibility. He lived an alone life. Now granted he had 12 friends, but they were really good to him most of the time. Other times they weren't all that reliable. There's still, those of you who are living alone right now, even those of you who are have a spouse, but that spouse is ill, and you're going to a nursing home, you're already experiencing that aloneness. When a relationship, just because of time, comes to an end. That's the first kind. The second, the loneliness of a broken dream. Every person at some time in their life will have a dream as to what their life will be like, what they want their life to be like. Young adults, dream that dream. It's an incredible, incredible thing to do, is to dream that dream. Career, marriage, home, impact on your world, something that you want to accomplish. Something happens. It's not turning out the way that you thought it would. Career. You went to work yesterday morning and there was a sign on the door that said this business is closed. Future shop yesterday morning. It wasn't the way you had it planned. It's called downsizing or rationalization. What it's really called. Or your health broke. It wasn't in the plans, but something happened to your health. Out of your control. Just it happened. And all those career plans just went up and smooth. Marriage, it started out so well, it just went so bad. You will see in today's bulletin prayer request from Kathy and Dave Case. Uh, I've written it, pray for several ministry and family challenges they are facing. Well, here's what happened. One of their daughters just had a new baby. Husband thought everything was fine, thought everything was going well. Marlena got up this morning after a particular rough night with the baby, new baby, and there was a note on the kitchen table, I'm out of this marriage. That shouldn't have happened to Dave and Kathy Casement. I mean, they're a missionary family. They shouldn't have had to go through that. But guess what? They are. It isn't the way it was planned, but it's a broken dream. And they're left as parents Thanks be to God for Lee and Randy. They've taken Marlene and the baby into their home. Unbelievable story. Just, just rocked us when we heard it. Guess what? There are no perfect families. And if you have a perfect family, get ready. <laughs> Imperfection cometh. See, it's, 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 it's this, this brokenness. It's this brokenness that Jesus experienced in this aloneness. I mean, 
This is his aloneness. The loneliness of a broken being. Someone has said, it will never happen to me, and guess what? It happened. Third, the loneliness of a broken relationship with God. My best way of putting it is that as I've wrestled with this now for almost 40 years, this concept of sin, my best way of putting it is that we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice. We have a propensity to do what is wrong, and then we act upon it many, many times. Especially before Jesus comes into our lives, our tendency, our propensity, is to act on it constantly, to do the wrong thing. But when Jesus comes into our lives, we still have to fight that off. That's still called sin when we do it. And that breaks the relationship that we have with God because he is a holy God. And we become estranged from the one who made us, and we are ultimately and finally in that situation alone. Now the question is, did Jesus ever feel that aloneness? Yeah, he did. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced that too. To redeem us, to be the final sacrifice for sin, offered once for all, the just for the unjust. He had to become sin. He experienced the ultimate loneliness, cosmic loneliness, if I can put it that way, the loneliness of a broken relationship with God. That's what he meant when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? August 1998. My brother Paul is dying of brain cancer. He's just had his uh, 41st birthday. He was diagnosed at age 39, the first year of his uh, of his uh, life after the diagnosis, he did very, very well, but the second year uh, was terrible. He had a surgery in January, a surgery in February, and a surgery in March, craniotomies at St. Michael's Toronto, uh, none of which worked. And the tumor just kept growing like topsy. It's August, and Paul, as it turns out, is six weeks away from death. He uh, is in the Uxbridge Cottage Hospital. Uh, Karen and I uh, go over to visit. This is one of those moments in my life that I have great regret about. I, I took uh, pastoral counseling. I took uh, pastoral ministry 101. I did all those courses that one is supposed to take in order to be able to do uh, counseling and uh, conversation with those who are dying. But I don't know why I said these words. I will never, ever know why I said these words. But whatever course I had taken, I flunked as soon as I said these words because it was just terrible. Paul's in a wheelchair. His head is over to the side. He can't hold his head up any longer. And, and sometimes he is cognitively aware of his surroundings, and other times he is not. He's a, a young Alzheimer patient. Why I said this, I don't know, but I did. I said to him, Paul, we share in your sufferings. My brother said back to me, I don't know how you could. He was exactly right. I can never say to you, I share in your sufferings unless I have experienced what you have experienced. And some of you here today have experiences that I do not have, and some I'm glad I don't have, to be honest. I don't want them, because you've been through some pretty heavy waters. But here's what I want you to hear this morning. If Jesus had said that, Paul, I share in your sufferings. It would have been exactly the truth. Why do I say that? Because 
somewhere around 3 p.m., A.D. 28, on a hill called Golgotha, a dying man screamed at the top of his lungs, raised his head to get the energy to fill his lungs one more time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Because he said those words and because he paid the price he enters into our brokenness he walks alongside us and he understands and he cares because he knows let's pray Because, Lord Jesus, you experienced what we should experience, complete and utter separation, estrangement from God. Because you screamed those words, that you were forsaken even of your Father. We don't have to say those words in the moment of our death. Because the opposite will be true. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Lord, maybe there's someone here this morning that just came to this sanctuary just feeling this incredible aloneness. Feeling that there is nobody in this world that understands what they're going through. Would you this morning, Jesus, tell them that you do right now, Jesus, by your spirit. Tell that person you understand and that you will walk with them. And Lord, if there's someone here who hasn't dealt with this great divide, this chasm between us and you that happens because of our propensity to do the wrong thing. I pray, Jesus, that this will be the moment of decision this day. And we'll thank you in your holy name.